Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to our lecture on the cytokines that we started uh, in the last lecture. So, uh, what we have discussed in our last lecture that the cytokines they, they are uh, primarily mediating their actions via different types of receptors. And we have discussed at least uh, five different classes of cytokine receptors. The immunoglobulin class, the class 1 receptors, the class 2 receptors, the TNF family receptors and the chemokine receptors. Now, looking into the receptors as I told that these receptor structures have been very well characterized and from the characterized receptor structures, we can have a, a fair idea of how these cytokines they mediate their action and how they probably um, exhibits uh, different types of activities like synergy, redundancy or antagonism. So, to get an understanding of how these actions are being mediated, let us look into the structures of the uh, different cytokine receptors. So, these are the five broad five classes of cytokine receptors that I have drawn here. So, this uh, is an immunoglobulin uh, family receptor which has this kind of disulfide linkages. Mm, so, this is the Ig class or the Ig family of receptors. This is the class 1 receptors, the class 1 receptors. Uh, these are the class 2 receptors, the class 2 or the interferon receptors. And then we have the TNF family of receptors and these are the chemokine family of receptors. As I told that these family of receptors are associated usually with G protein. So, these are G protein coupled receptors. So, if you look into the structure of the basic structure of these all these receptors, these receptors they share a uh, similarity in their structures whereas, the chemokine receptors they differ a little bit. So, these receptors have a very uh, common uh, thing amongst them is that they have certain conserved cysteine residues. These are the conserved marked in red, these are the conserved cysteine residues. And they ha also have a very conserved motif that is a WSX WS that is a tryptophan serine, tryptophan serine repeat with any amino acid in between. So, this is a very common uh, repeat that is found in case of the class 1 receptors. And the class 2 receptors also has this kind of conserved cysteine residues. And uh, these, uh, these are the TNF uh, family of receptors. They also are uh, characterized by presence of lot of this conserved cysteine residues. So, these are the broad classification of the different types of cytokine receptors to which the cytokines they can bind. Now, how the cytokines they mediate the action by binding to these receptors. So, binding to these receptors is kind of a, a structural binding let us say. So, there is a kind of a lock and key system of binding. So, a, a receptor usually has a ligand binding area or a region where this uh, ligand he in this case cytokine is the ligand, the cytokine molecule is the ligand it can bind. If we look into one of the very most studied family of the cytokine receptors which is none other than the class 1 receptors. Now, this class 1 receptors if you look into the class 1 receptors, the class 1 receptors can again 
be sub classified we can sub classify the class 1 receptors into at least three different so if i call this the class 1 cytokine receptors this class 1 receptors can be again sub classified and they can be classified into three families one the gm c s f that is the granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor it is also a cytokine and it binds to this kind of cytokines it can bind to gm c s f as well as to i l 3 and i l 5. So, this class of receptor they are called the gm c s f uh, receptor subfamily. So, this sub family it is the sub family of receptor remember. So, this falls under the cl classification of class 1 receptor a second class of receptor is I L 2 R receptor sub family they are named after a particular cytokine they bind to, but they can bind other cytokines as well. For example, this class uh, IL 2 R subfamily it can bind to interleukin 2, interleukin 4, interleukin 7, interleukin 9 all of them, but they are named after the interleukin 2. So, it is a IL 2 R R for receptor. So, interleukin 2 receptor subfamily and also the IL 6 receptor the interleukin 6 subfamily. of receptors and they can also bind to interleukin 6 or interleukin 11. This subfamily it can bind to interleukin 2, interleukin 4, uh, IL 7. So, it can bind to many. This can bind to IL 3, IL 5 as well as GM CSF. Now, these receptors are usually characterized by presence of more than one subunit. Now, it is a multi subunit receptor. If you look into the pictures that I have drawn here in this part or in this section, you see that at least there are two different subunits and we could call them the alpha subunit and the beta subunit. Now, among these subunits try to understand carefully. So, among these subunits of the receptors, one of the subunit is primarily responsible for recognition and binding of the ligand that is the cytokine and the other receptor or the other subunit binds only when there is a ligand binding by the other receptor counterpart. So, that means, the alpha subunit here for example, this alpha subunit can recognize the specific ligand for example, interleukin 5 or interleukin 3 or interleuk or GM CSF. As soon as alpha subunit binds, but this binding is called a low affinity binding and hence the receptor is also called this alpha receptor is called the low affinity receptor because the rebinding is complete only in presence of the other receptor counterpart that is the beta. Now, when there is a low affinity binding by the alpha subunit, then only the beta subunit comes in. Now, then the beta subunit comes in and there is a high affinity binding. So, now this is a high affinity receptor because now you have both the alpha and the beta subunits. Beta subunit is primarily less primarily responsible for the signal transduction. So, this is where from the downstream signal is transduced. So, it is the binding or the receptor binding to the ligand is complete 
when on when and when only both the alpha and the beta subunits they bind and this binding offers is offered primarily by the alpha subunit because the alpha subunit has more specificity for the ligand but until and unless the beta subunit binds the binding is not completed and hence it is called a low affinity binding once there is by binding by the beta subunit then only it is a high affinity binding and it binds with high affinity to the ligand. Now, once this high affinity binding is completed the beta subunit is responsible for the transduction of the signal downstream. Now, let us see how this kind of receptors the or the receptor ligand binding actually mediates the phenomenon like redundancy or antagonism in case of the cytokines. Now, one, mo one most important thing that we need to remember in this case is that the alpha subunits have if you look into the structure here the alpha subunits are specific ligand structure specific. That means, they offer specific structures for specific, uh, specific binding sites for the specific ligands or the specific cytokines, but the beta subunits are non-selective. So, they are common the beta subunit in case of this class 1 receptor or to be precise in case of this GMCSF subfamily the beta subunit is common to all alpha and beta subunits they do not remain together bound together. So, they do they normally they do not dimerize they remain separately. So, for example, on this uh, on this the, if this is the cell surface of the cell membrane you will be finding beta subunits which are lying independent of the alpha subunits. Once there is ligand binding like this once there is in, uh, an interleukin binding to its corresponding alpha subunit then only this beta subunit comes and completes this binding. Then only the one of the beta subunits will be available and binding to this alpha subunit bound to the corresponding cytokine. So, let us say these are the three different alpha subunits that are present on the membrane corresponding to the three different uh, cytokines like IL-5, IL-3 and GMCSF. If you look I have written the, uh, uh, the, the legends for IL-5 is the triangle, uh, the circle denotes the IL-3 and the square denotes the GMCSF. So, now this, <coughs> this kind of beta subunits they are floating around they are not bound to the corresponding alpha subunits. Now, what happens whenever there is uh, ligand receptor binding there is the alpha subunit is binding to the corresponding cytokine the beta subunit will come and join and it will produce the high affinity receptor. Now, what happens in case of redundant action? In case of redundancy we see something very similar. So, now if there is if there is presence of all the cytokines, if there is a presence of all of the cytokines surrounding then what will happen that means, all the three cytokines are available be it the IL 5 or the IL 3 or the GMCSF then actually they will saturate all the three types of alpha subunit that are present. So, these are the alpha subunits they will saturate all the three types of alpha sub corresponding alpha subunits and the beta subunits will bind to them and since the beta subunit is common to all of them they will transduce the same signal that means, downstream signaling the same signal will be transduced and that is why we call that these uh, three. So, I L 3, I L 5 and G M C S F 
they can exhibit redundancy. So, because it, it transduces the same signal or the redundant signal. Then what is how do they exhibit antagonism? As I told normally what happens normally on the surface of the cell or on the surface we have this alpha the alpha for let us say these are the alpha subunits that are present for IL 3 and also you have the alpha subunits present for the GMCSF and the IL 5. Now, in the vicinity there is a lot of IL 3 molecules and also a little bit of the GMCSF molecules. So, what will happen in this situation that if more of this uh, stoichiometrically if, if the alpha uh, if the uh, IL 3 molecules are more then they will quickly go and saturate the alpha subunits of the IL 3. So, the IL 3 alpha subunits will be quickly saturated and only a very few of the uh, GMCSF uh, family or the GMCSF subunits alpha subunits will be saturated. So, now these are the alpha subunits. The main problem is with the beta subunit. Now, the beta subunit they are limited you do not have a lot of beta subunits. So, there is a limitation of the beta subunits. So, let us say you have only this many beta subunits. So, if the ligand in this case it is IL 3 if it competes out the other ligand in binding to its corresponding alpha subunit that means if a lot of IL 3 goes and initially binds to the alpha subunits of the IL 3 receptors then these IL 3 receptors will be saturated. So, now they will immediately bind to they will occupy all the beta subunits that are present and there would not be beta subunit left out that can go and bind to this alpha subunit of the GMCSF. So, the situation will be something like this that all these alpha subunits the situation will look something like this. So, now these beta subunits will go and immediately bind to this alpha subunits which are already bound to the IL 3 ligand and there would not be any beta subunit available to bind to the alpha subunit of the GMCSF. So, this and as I told if there is no beta subunit binding if there is no beta subunit binding then the high affinity receptors will not be produced. So, it will remain as low affinity receptor and it will not transduce any signal. So, basically the here in this case we see an example of interleukin 3 and GMCSF competing with each other they are competing with each other for the alpha subunits and the IL 3 since it is more uh, as compared to the GMCSF it will go and immediately saturate all the alpha subunits or the uh, IL 3 alpha subunits. And since the beta subunit is common and of course, the number of beta subunits is limited that will go and bind to the alpha subunits that are already saturated with IL 3 and beta subunits will not be available to bind to the alpha subunits which are filled with or bound to the GMCSF. So, naturally there would not be any signal transduction there will be any downstream signaling because of uh, unavailability of the beta subunits that can bind to the GMCSF. So, basically we see an example of how uh, IL 3 can antagonize the uh, 
uh, GMCSF. Looking into the another class of the receptor that is what we call as uh, the interleukin 2 receptors or the IL 2 receptors this is this also belongs to the class 1 receptors remember this is still the class 1 receptor do not confuse it with the class 2 receptors it is the IL 2 R interleukin 2 receptor type it is not class 2 it is class 1 class 2 receptors are primarily meant for the interferons. So, this is still the class 1 receptors uh, they are named after the type of uh, interleukins or cytokines they bind to and that is interleukin 2. These receptors are characterized by a common gamma subunit if you see they have a common gamma subunit unlike in case of the um, GMCSF family where we have seen they have a common beta subunit these receptors are usually characterized by the presence of a common gamma subunit and there is also they can also exist in the three forms that is the low affinity form the intermediate affinity form and the high affinity form so the low affinity form is only the alpha subunit the intermediate form is the beta gamma subunit and the high affinity form is when all the alpha, beta and the gamma all the three can bind to the ligand together. So, the gamma chain is kind of expressed constitutively. So, it is always expressed in, in most of the cell types and uh, the alpha and the beta chains these alpha and the beta chains they are restricted to activation. So, alpha beta chains are not always expressed the alpha and the beta chains are uh, kind of their expression is restricted and they are restricted to the activation and that is why that ensures that only when uh, there is an antigen binding to for example, for the T cells the CD 4 plus and the CD 8 plus T cells. So, activation of these T cells it ensures that only when there is an antigen activation this CD4 and the CD8 cells they express the high affinity receptors. So, the high affinity uh, uh, IL2Rs it is not expressed under normal conditions. Uh, so, that is why you have three different uh, receptor subunits the alpha, the beta and the gamma. So, the alpha and the beta uh, subunit expressions of this receptor expression is mostly coordinated with um, uh, the activation. So, once there is an activation of the cell or the T cell for example, then only the alpha and the beta subunits will be expressed and that would lead to formation of the high affinity receptor that a high affinity receptor is the effective form of the receptor that can only transduce the signal the low affinity receptors cannot transduce the signal remember. So, the low affinity form or the intermediate affinity form can never transduce the signal they have lower affinity for the corresponding ligand and the high affinity signal a high affinity receptor is the receptor type which can actually transduce the signal downstream and it is formed only in presence of alpha beta gamma the three subunits together in this case and in as I told that the gamma subunit is the constitutively expressed and the alpha and the beta subunit expression is primarily uh, linked to the activation and this phenomenon uh, basically ensures that the T cell uh, can express the high affinity receptor only the high affinity receptors only when there is an activation not always. So, they are not always uh, and not always binding to I IL 2 uh, always they are not. So, T cells are not always uh, they are secreting the IL 2 or binding to the IL 2 IL 2 receptors the high affinity receptors are not always present. So, let us uh, let us see how or what exactly happens downstream of the ligand binding or downstream of the binding of cytokines. So, downstream means after there is a high affinity receptor formation and high affinity receptor binding what happens next. So, what is happening next that means how the signal is transduced 
we have understood the receptor types, the different receptor types. We have kind of uh, a fair idea about the different receptor subunits and how they work and uh, what are the low, high and intermediate affinity receptors. But now, we need to know that how these receptors they actually function, they actually work. So, most of these receptors they are linked to what we uh, what is known as a jack stat pathway what is this jack stat pathway what is this jack the jack is named after the janus it's the named after the janus and it's the janus kinase and the stat which is uh, the stat is also known as a signal transducer and activator of transcription. So, this is an activator of transcription, transcription activator. And this is the Janus kinase. It is uh, sometimes uh, we also call it like a just another kinase. It is just a uh, joke to say the jack is just because in, inside the cell we have so many kinases in so many uh, signal transduction processes that are going on and usually all these signal transduction processes they are mediated via these different types of kinases. And so, we sometimes call them as just another kinase, but it is not really the fact. Mm, so, it is named after this Janus which is a Greek god and uh, so, it is a jack kinase which actually activates the stat or the tra another transcriptional activator or the stat. So, let us see how this works, how this jack stat pathway it actually works. So, most of these uh, receptors of uh, the cytokine family, they are linked to a, uh, one of these type of tyrosine uh, receptor tyrosine kinases like this jack which is also a receptor tyrosine kinase and this jack is associated with these uh, receptors with this with this let us say this is the alpha and the beta subunits of the receptors. They are associated with this alpha beta subunits of the receptors whenever there is a binding of a cytokine or a ligand to this receptor. This receptor is bound to this cytokine. This jack is activated. So, th that leads to active the first step is activation of jack. So, now jack is activated and now once jack is activated the jack what it can do is it can phosphorylate. Now, it starts to phosphorylate when jack starts to phosphorylate the receptor subunits. So, now it phosphorylates at specific sites on this, these are all tyrosine kinase receptors and so they are, uh, they are phosphorylated at specific uh, sites. So, they are at specific tyrosine residues on the receptor subunits. Now, when this tyrosine residues on the receptor subunit are being phosphorylated, that basically offers a site for this stat. Now, this stat normally is roaming around and now the, that leads to that brings the stat to this site or that helps the stat to dock on to the receptor. Now, the stat goes and docks on docking of the stat. So, the next step is docking of stat. So, now stat which is normally moving around it goes and docks on the receptor or binds to the receptor. So, normally the stat cannot bind. The stat can bind only when there is phosphorylation of this tyrosine residues on the receptor by the jack. Jack is activated. Activation of jack leads to phosphorylation of specific tyrosine residues on the receptors on the receptor subunits and that brings the stat there at that place. 
Now, once the stat is docked on the receptor or there is binding of the stat to the receptor, then immediately this jack it phosphorylates stat. Now, stat is then phosphorylated. There is phosphorylation of the stat and this stat phosphorylation leads to that leads to the dimerization of the stat. So, this is the phosphorylated the two subunits of the stat and this is the phosphorylated stat. So, this docking of the stat and then stat phosphorylates phosphorylation of stat. Now, stat is phosphorylated and as soon as it is phosphorylated, this phosphorylated stat now translocates to the nuclei. It enters the nuclei and so now it dimerizes. Who dimerizes? The stat dimerizes and this dimer then it translocates to it translocates to the nucleus. So, that leads to translocation to the nucleus and finally, gene expression. So, that leads to expression of So, that leads to gene expression or transcription of specific genes that mediates the function. So, this is the overview of the, um, uh, of the way how the cytokine receptor downstream of cytokine binding actually works. So, let us consider this is the cytokine. The cytokine binds to the receptor. So, the alpha and the beta subunits they normally remain apart when there is cytokine binding they come together. So, there is receptor dimerization and when this receptor dimerization occurs the receptor dimerizes or they comes together then there is activation of jack this is the first event. Then receptor dimerization leading to the activation of jack. When there is activation of jack as I told jack is a uh, tyrosine kinase uh, receptor. So, it immediately phosphorylates Tar specific target tyrosine residues in the receptor subunits. Now, these tyrosine residues which gets phosphorylated in the receptor, they now can offer site, they can offer a site for binding of the stat that is docking of the stat. Now, the stat then moves and comes to the receptor and docks on the receptor or this binds to the receptor. The docking of the stat is basically ensures or it is required for phosphorylation of the stat. Now, the phosphorylation of stat occurs by the same Janus kinase or the jack. So, jack now phosphorylates stat and this phosphorylated stat normally the stat is not phosphorylated. When it is docked to the receptor it gets phosphorylated by the jack and then as soon as it gets phosphorylated it dimerizes and dimerization. So, this is the dimeric stat this is a stat dimer that stat dimer then translocates to the nucleus and then it codes and binds to the corresponding DNA sequence it has to bind to and then it activates gene expression or it activates transcription of some specific target genes and that is how the whole signaling process works. So, um, I think uh, we have uh, been able to uh, I have told uh, about the uh, different forms of types of receptors, receptor binding and a very basic overview of the receptor um, subtypes and a very basic overview of the mode of functioning of the receptor. So, we will uh, stop here for today uh, for, for this lecture. And we will discuss about, we will we'll keep discussing about the cytokines and the different uh, actions of the cytokines in our upcoming lecture. Thank you.